I'd encourage people to sit as far forward as you can. It's a little hard to uh, hear it here, and I'm probably not going to run around with the microphone. Uh, we'll see how that works out. The other thing is, last time we gave you an evaluation form for the last session, we're going to wait till the end of the next, the fourth session. So three more after this, and then we'll give you an evaluation sheet so we don't inundate you with paper. Um, don't know that I have anything else. Anybody who wasn't here the first time? Okay, a few of you. So just real quick things, safety stuff, exits in the back and in the front. We have muster areas on that side of the building. If we have an emergency, go that way. If you can't get around that way, muster over here at the parking lot. 911 works on the phone. Just call 911 if we have an emergency, okay? And if something's going on, we see smoke or something, find a JLab employee and follow them out. So after that, I think, start the route. Thanks. <coughs> We want to start where we left off last time. Last time it was the introduction, so I was kind of quick, a little quick, but this time, if you have any questions, I guess we'll just start there and uh, we'll get into the details rather than cover more of it. We'll try to do more in depth. Uh, These are the four uh, subsections we are going to cover approximately 20 minutes each. And if you have any questions on the last session, any that was an introductory. Uh, but one of the things that uh, happened is uh, I had uh, an error in, uh, instead of, it was set as a 500 hertz, it's supposed to be 500 megahertz. But Jay Benesh uh, kind of gave me more accurate than what I had. Basically, he said the frequency range normally counts is from 100 megahertz to 3000 for cryogenic things and, uh, and for high quality beam. Also, but there are some normal uh, of these uh, frequency, I mean, normal conducting things are used for 1 megahertz to 11.4 for uh, uh, AM type uh, of <coughs> high frequencies. But that's just to differentiate and just start now, put this back into correct the whole ones. So going back, uh, With the basically the helium refrigerators are no, ref no different than from your home uh, refrigerators. Uh, so let's so what's a refrigerator? A refrigerator is basically takes energy from low temperature and transfer to high temperature. It's basically like a bucket. You take water from uh, well and bring it up to use like that. But it's basically transfer of energy from one temperature to other temperatures in the refrigerator. Uh, most of the time we use the term refrigerator where we absorb heat at constant temperature and reject it uh, at constant temperature. Also. 
we absorb heat into a liquid and vaporize it and we compress and we reject heat and condense the gas back to liquid and the cycle repeats. So let's look at an ideal uh, cycle. This is called the Carnot cycle. Basically, what it has is a Uh, is a, this is where we absorb heat and we take this vapor, we compress in a compressor, we reject in a, a, a condenser coil outside uh, so where we reject heat and we, then we expand back from the high pressure down to the low pressure and the cycle repeats. And if you look at an NTS diagram or the temperature entropy diagram, the thermodynamic terms, so this is the amount of heat being absorbed from this low temperature heat low and it is compressed from here to there at constant entropy in an ideal compressor. And then uh, the high, high temperature, uh, high pressure gas is condensed at constant temperature and it becomes liquid and it is expanded. So the amount of heat absorbed is here, the amount of work going into the compressor is here and the amount of heat is rejected there. So if we do in a thermodynamic analysis of what does it take to perform a cycle like this, absorbing the, uh, the, <coughs> the input work is basically the, uh, the x-axis times the y-axis, that's the amount of input work. So that is T high minus T low times the delta S. And the amount of heat absorbed is the T low times the delta S. So this is the amount of heat absorbed, this is the amount of input work. So the coefficient of performance is defined as what's useful for us versus what it takes to do the work. So this is the amount of uh, amount of energy we absorb, but this is the amount of work we need to put in. So if we divide that, then this is called the coefficient of performance of the machine. But we normally use the inverse of it to say, okay, to get a one watt, uh, we use the inverse of the COP or watt per watt. How many watts we need to put in, in our electric power to get one watt of cooling is more like what are we paying to get that cooling is what we use our one hour COP basically gives us watt per watt uh, in, information. So if we take our refrigerator in our home and plug in the numbers, uh, say for example in your house uh, you want to freeze in the freezer, uh, the coil runs around minus 10 C because the at zero C is where you freeze the water, but it has to be cooler than that. Your foam is around, say, in summer, gets hot, but it re rejects uh, the coil behind the uh, refrigerator runs as hard as 50 C. So if you calculate these and plug into the numbers, what we just said, it says I can get 4.4 watts of cooling for one watt of uh, uh, compressor work. So the, the karma work, uh, uh, for 4.4 watts of 4.4 kilowatts of cooling is one kilowatt, and for uh, simple mind thinking, sometimes it confuses people. Looking at how can we get 4.4 kilowatts of cooling if we only put in one watt of cooling? That's where the term refrigeration comes into picture. Refrigeration is not conversion of energy; it is just a transfer of energy from one temperature to other temperature. So it's basically like a picking up the bucket taking some quantity from one elevate, one temperature level to the other temperature, but we are not converting from one, like a thermal energy from in a power plant to an electrical or mechanical in your car. So that's not what we are doing. We are not converting anything. We are just basically transporting the quantity of energy from one state to the state. That's where the refrigerator differs from your power uh, or energy conversion. So that's one of the things sometimes uh, people not really export deep in thermodynamics get, or it looks like we are violating some fundamental laws. We are not in a refrigerator. So that's why we, we can get as much as 4.4 kilowatts of cooling for one watt of and in your home refrigerator in an ideal uh, system. This so, so it's not a violation because it's refrigeration is just a transfer, it is not conversion. So thermodynamic efficiency is the ratio of ideal input power to the actual input power. So now we introduce the term efficiency. So <coughs> we use the Carnot cycle. Carnot cycle is the completely 100% reversible. There are no losses involved. It's all ideal fluids. Ideal <coughs> is ideal. 
So we can compare how close we are to ideally possible things. That's why we use the cycle, the Carmel cycle. So the, it's always good to say, okay, it's like 100% system. I mean, not that it's practical, but it's always good to us to compare how close we are to the most 100%. So for a given uh, state in a cycle, go from point one to point two, uh, the, uh, the <coughs> With no irreversibility is a completely reversible. The amount of heat transfer is T D S. That's what we have seen in the TS diagram. This is the basically the second law of thermodynamics. This is the statement of the second law. So Carnot cycle is an ideal cycle in the sense that there are no irreversibility is involved. Or there's no lost work. Everything is if you're going forward with the same amount of energy, you can come back. It, uh, anything you put in, you can reverse it back. That's what the Carnot cycle is. So the term idealized cycle, we, we use it for visualizing, introducing some real fluids, things like that, still ideal properties. So we go step by step from Carno cycle, which is 100%, then we use with ideal gas, then we use idealized. So we move forward in going towards the more practical systems as we go through these classes. So but we start with the most ideal thing, which is the Carno cycle. So Carno cycle has the maximum COP or the coefficient of performance. So this gives the distinction. That's why we use because there is nothing else in practice comes as close to this as possible. So we use this as the, our yardstick for measuring everything else with respect to this. So now in thermal systems, we use the term XRG and the, uh, the, the reversible work. It's uh, basically the karma work. So how if, if the, in a thermodynamic uh, uh, coordinates, it's basically the, the enthalpy minus the, the reference temperature times the entropy will give you amount of availability in a fluid. Basically what we're saying is, at the room temperature, we got so much amount of energy available, so many BTUs, but this zero grain is it's workless. Either it is higher temperature to the environment, like your car engine where you, you fuel bonds, raises to the temperature, you work, extract work, and you dump it to the environment. Basically, environment, we use it as a uh, zero reference. Or in our refrigerator, we use the compressors, all the power goes in into the helium compression and the cooling oil and we dump it into the cooling tower which rejects into the environment. So basically the environment, which is the zero gradient where we have a lot of energy but it's not useful. So that's why we refer that to the zero uh, level of energy with reference to that. That's, that's the temperature we use as a zero, zero availability. So why, what's so different about thermal systems compared to the electrical systems? See, in an ideal electrical transformer, for example. So in an ideal electrical transformer, if we put, say, 110 here, we can get 220 here. Or if we put 220 here, 110 here, voltage and current for a given power are constant. But in thermal systems, the thermodynamic law is uh, it's not, temperature is similar to the voltage, current is similar to the en energy. Uh, but the, the law, with thermal law which dictates is the entropy is constant, not temperature times the, uh, the em energy. That's not constant here. So this is what makes difference from electrical. So, I mean, we can ask a question, why we need any input energy to transfer energy, like in, say in electrical, go from one voltage to other voltage, we don't need any. Basically, for a given power, we can take 110 and we can make it 220, I mean, just very little loss. So, in thermal, we don't have that luxury. We do not have a transformer. That's what makes it like more interesting, more complicated, whatever, whichever way you want to look at it. And that introduces the call term of quality of energy in thermal systems. So where is that? There is a quality involved where, say for example, in helium refrigerators, the quality at 4 Kelvin is 70 watts for a given watt at room temperature. We'll go into that. 
I don't know, uh, 2 Kelvin is 150 watts per 1 watt. And so there is a quality factor involved, and which is, they all have on a thermodynamic scale as the same energy, same reference of. On thermodynamic basis, they are equal, but that is the amount of quality it takes to get there. So, <coughs> so we use the term source and a sink for uh, in taking the energy from the source and we dump it to the sink of the environment, and that's where we from pump it energy, I mean, heat energy from low temperature to high temperature. So, the minimum work required, see, see, this is our interest. So, uh, are the reverse ball is, is, is independent of the path. Say, for example, if you want to go from here to California, for example, if everything is 100% uh, efficient, like the airplane, and there is no wind resistance, and whether you go from here through Dallas, or whether you go from Tokyo to California, it will take the same thing, as long as there is no losses involved. The, that's where the ideal uh, work different. In a real, we know there's a big difference. The path plays a role. But in the ideal systems, this path, it is independent of the path you take. And also, it is independent of the fluid you use. For example, say people, a uh, lot of times you get confused, I mean, by using helium instead of air for it, uh, in a nitrogen liquefier, is it more efficient? Not really. They are, on an ideal basis, the, uh, the cycle efficiency is independent of the fluid. And basically what it is saying is on an ideal basis the uh, ideal cycles are completely path and fluid independent. Then what drives them? What drives the choice of the fluids is basically we have certain amount of components available, the compressors, uh, uh, expanders, the heat exchangers, which have less ever, uh, irreversibilities with certain fluid characteristics because of the viscosity effects, because of the thermoconductivity effects. And so we try to use, choose the fluid based on the temperatures we want to reach and taking advantage of the real fluid properties. So that's how we try to match it. But most of the first driving factor is the fluid has to liquid in fluid form. Like we can't use A to go to 4K because it freezes up. So it has to be still exist in liquid form. So that drives the fundamental. And, but we don't use helium to do, uh, to liquefy air because the losses involved, the specificity of helium is five times more than the nitrogen or air. And so the heat exchanger losses really stack up more. So we try to take it, use all these various properties put together in choosing the available components, what works well for these compressors, what works well for the heat exchangers, the expanders, and and the temperature we need to reach, and is the fluid still functional in those ranges. So those are all the things which put together in selecting the fluid and the path depends upon what, com what type of expander we got, what type of compressor we got, what type of heat exchanger we got. They set the various paths we take in coming up with the cycle. So on an ideal, what I'm trying to get across is, on an ideal basis, the fluid is the same, or if the fluid is very close to ideal, it doesn't matter which fluid we use. And if the path we are taking is reversible, it doesn't matter how we work. Whether I come across like this or whether I come across, whichever way I come across to get here, if there is no irreversible this and it will take the same amount of energy. So those are the two fundamental things normally not clear to, uh, in a lot of thermal classes, thermodynamics people take. So in, on an ideal basis, the path, I mean, the, the efficiency is independent of the path if it's reversible. And the fluid has, does not play uh, uh, in efficiency unless, except it's irreversible on an ideal basis. So because why I'm saying is, when I first took, I'm after taking some thermodynamic courses and when I was involved in the refrigeration business in my family thing, I was under the impression that we used to use ammonia for the uh, regular uh, freezing uh, uh, plants. Then, uh, at that point, they, uh, all the technicians used to tell me, oh, there is a kind of free arm, which will give you a lot more efficiency. And I didn't know at that time, I thought fluid does play a role. It only plays a second order role. 
from the viscosity point of view, from the heat transfer point of view. From a wall off, it takes the same kilowatts per watt if they reverse pull this on a second order. Whether you use Freon or whether you use ammonia or whether you use something else, it's second order effects. Or it helps you in choosing the various components, whether you use Freon 11, Freon 22, Freon 12. Basically, it determines what is the discharge pressure you get for a given outdoor temperature, what's the low temperature you can get. So it tells you, it helps you to choose various different types of components to use your cycle. But basically the fluid on a first order basis doesn't participate in efficiency. So the system performance is basically in ideal, so in ideal system we convert 100% back and forth, that's what we said. So approximately if you take, we said 4.4 kilowatts will give us 1 kilowatt, I mean 1 kilowatt of input will give us 4 kilowatts. But in real systems it's all, it takes, I mean we, we need 1 kilowatt for a 3 kilowatts. And we said okay, uh, quality of energy. So this is the basically our home refrigerator or air conditioner. What do we got? We got the load, we vaporize it, the Freon, and it goes to a compressor, it compresses it. But it, and it picks up heat, it is not compressed at constant temperature and the entropy increases. Then we have a sensible cooling. First the gas has to lose its super heat before it starts condensing. Then once it's liquid, it is expanded in a valve because it, it's not economical to use expanders for these things. And so the cycle repeats. So we introduce a certain amount of losses here and certain uh, real uh, <coughs> effects of the fluids into this uh, cycle. Basically here, it takes around the, uh, so instead of, uh, it takes around 3 kilowatts for one, I mean 1 kilowatt of input power for 3 kilowatts of cooling. And now this has a 0.68% uh, uh, of performance. That is called the exotic efficiency or the carbon efficiency of the cycle is around 68%. If it takes, instead of 4.4 kilowatts of cooling, if you are only getting 3 kilowatts for a given one, 1 kilowatt input power, because of the losses involved, you have an entropy increase here, you have a sensible cooling here, you have an entropy increase here because your cooling is not constant entropy. So these are the losses which lost the amount of cooling from 4.4 kilowatts to 3 kilowatts. So the, your efficiency now dropped to 68% from 100% compared to carbon. So this is the Hampson process first used to liquefy. Uh, you take the liquid air and uh, you go through a heat exchanger and uh, you compress back and you use a high temperature, high pressure to uh, cool it back and you expand it and you put heat. So you can absorb heat by repeating the cycle and you can reach lower temperatures uh, depending on the fluid and the component choices. So this is the modified Brayton cycle. Brayton cycle is originally a power cycle, but refrigeration is modified. Uh, so whereas you take, uh, you absorb, so this is what we use in our shield refrigerator. For example, we absorb heat from 20K to 30K, uh, 30 to 40K like that. And we put in uh, heat, say 20 to 30 Kelvin. 30 Kelvin goes into the compressor, and, I mean heat exchanger. It comes close to the room temperature and room temperature will compress back and uh, we reject heat here. We take the room temperature and we cool it back uh, to close to the 30 Kelvin and we go through an expander and we repeat this cycle. Basically this is the modified Brayton cycle, this is what we use in our field expanders. And uh, this is called the Clark process where to improve, to reach lower and lower temperatures because of the losses involved in the various components and the fluids we cannot get to low enough temperature. So the, the Clark cycle will help to absorb certain amount of heat exchanger losses and also to provide cool in case we are liquefied and say we are taking away liquid out of here, there is not enough uh, cold gas coming back to cool on the high side. So we, we need to produce certain amount of refrigeration to provide the additional fluid which we are taking away to be cooled. So we use the expanders. That's the basic. Uh, Clark process. Then Sam Collins uh, at MIT, when we started using the helium liquefiers, 
In previous to Sam Collins, uh, uh, most of the liquefied uh, helium was liquefied using hydrogen pre-cooling, pumping on it. Of course, there were some mechanical expanders were developed, but still were not really reliable or anything until uh, uh, Sam Collins at MIT produced uh, two expansion level, uh, 1400, basically a lot of their more than a couple thousand uh, systems in the world which are working on this principle where this made helium available to most of the universities and laboratories for the low temperature research. This basically made most of our developments which we make a living on today possible. So the key steps in this are the coefficient of performance, uh, thermodynamic efficiency, the Carnot cycle, the quality of thermal energy, the reversible work and the fluid work process, etc. And the present day cryogenic process cycles are an extension of the our home refrigerator more exotic. So that's basically the first introduction to the thermal. Any questions, I guess, before I go to the next one? Basically, there is a book in the, in the thing which basically explains in a little more detail. That's what we teach at the Cryogenic Engineering Conference, which goes into more detail. And if you guys have questions later on, feel free to call me or get in touch with me, and we can I'll try to explain to the extent I can from the practical. See, most of the time, what comes is uh, it, there, there is a conflict in our head between what we see versus what we study. That's what I'm trying to clarify here, from what we see, how we think versus what really thermodynamics is telling. There's not, nothing more than that. Yes, next chapter two. Where it is going, what you are paying, 
which he, how much heat exchanger is costing you, how much a turbine is costing you, how much you are paying, and eventually going to the load. Everything comes out in this exergy analysis. That's the power of this. Is with. Very clearly will define you. And that's what we use uh, to decide optimums, and that's what we'll go into to say in trade off principles of. If we invest another hundred thousand uh, dollars into, our, say, bigger heat exchange, what what would it give us back in terms of reduced utility powers or reduced? So we can do a trade-off study in terms of um, uh, the, our operating power to the capped out, and also in terms of the reliability. And as we make it more and more complicated and exotic, there's some point of no return. So we can look all these things on the paper before we build these things. So that's what this and this analysis will give you. And it's very powerful. The more paper you understand, the more you enjoy it because it keeps showing you. It's like our own, when you go into your own looking at uh, uh, meditation, whatever, and you want to understand the nature okay, in different forms. And for Thermodan people, this basically tells all the things we ever wanted to know about the whole cycle and where we are spending it. And we enjoy that because we can figure it out where we are spending the uh, uh, energy we are putting in. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. What is the small change in X energy or X zero or H one T zero Yeah, this one. The small change. Uh, this one is the enthalpy of a fluid at any given temperature. But can we find somewhere? What's that? And yeah, it's in the notes. Yeah, it, it's 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 in there. All these things are defined in the notes. Uh, all the yeah, they all defined. Uh, basically, H is the enthalpy. T naught is your reference temperature, and S is the entropy of a fluid. And they are in the notes behind the not, may not be in the slides, but there's a which goes into the this note. Uh, these slides follow the notes in the back. So, okay, when we apply to a cycle, for example, the karma cycle, this is basically like what we said is W karma, work input is the, the sink temperature of where we reject our heat, like the cooling tower or the ambient times the delta S minus delta S. That's the amount of input work, this is the karma system. And what this tells is, this has so many things buried in it as, as you keep looking at it and looking at it, and you will start seeing. How much information is in it? Basically, T naught delta S is the heat rejected to the environment. See, when we put work into the compressor, say, let's say a CHO, we put in, say, five or six megawatts. All the six megawatts we dump into the cooling tower. So, basically, then, what is producing refrigeration? So, basically, this tells you this is the heat rejected T naught delta S, it's all going there. Our the input power, so six megawatts of electric power we put in, it's all gone there. And the delta H is the heat absorbed in the ideal refrigeration or the ideal work output from an experiment. Basically, expanded output and the amount of refrigeration we produce in an ideal cycle that heat. Because the rest of the heat, um, the rest of the, all the work, all the energy went in compression is basically in thermal terms is rejected into the cooling tower. So only what is basically it is like uh, you take the uh, milk uh, and churn it and the butter, what goes into the cold box is very little amount of it and the rest of the other milk is thrown away at the cooling tower. Or uh, all the megawatts which we put into the compressor are thrown into the cooling tower except it enters the cold box. In, um, from, it comes from out of the cold box at one atmosphere at 300 K. It goes back into the cold box at 18 or 20 atmospheres at the 300 K. So we reduce the entropy by rejecting all this, and we made it more quality fluid going to the cold box. We improve the quality, but not thermal energy. There, there's a difference. We do not put uh, high energy into the cold box. We put high availability into the cold box, or it is like more quality form of the same thermal level fluid goes in. It is coming at 300K. If you look at the enthalpy difference between 
what comes out of the cold box at one atmosphere and what goes into the cold box at um, 18 atmosphere at 300 Kelvin, very close to the second order terms, is same enthalpy level. But the quality is the difference between those two. That's what makes it. And that's what we're trying to say here is the, this is the amount because we absorb, we our expanders will take so much heat at different temperatures out and makes the quality more. And that's the amount of heat we add in the cryo modules or into the shields. And this is the ideal net input power. So some of this, what is coming out of the expander, and sometimes like at CTR, the recipe expanders have a reverse bulk break where it generates certain power as it expands and it goes back into the power, power grid. So basically the amount of net power coming into the compressor is, we recover this power and that much is, uh, is reduced from the net power. What's that? The better the quality, the closer you are to ideal. Is what's, that, what's I'm trying to understand quality. Quality is uh, the, how much reduced, uh, how much is uh, we are reducing the entropy. Uh, the lowest entropy form is the higher quality for refrigeration. So as you compress the one atmosphere gas to 18 atmosphere from 300K back to 300K, we reduce the entropy that is called increase in available and increase in quality. The quality is most of the terms in thermodynamic form is the entropy. The less of the entropy, it has the higher quality. Because in any form, any in any of the processes, the entropy increases except reversal. So basically, a refrigerator transfers heat energy from low temperature to high temperature. And most of our helium refrigerators are working from 4.2K to 300K. Now, let's differentiate, although we are talking refrigerator, but we also use liquefiers, where let's take CDR form. Some of the folks who are outside us, excuse me, because I'm trying, I guess people may not be familiar, but uh, I'm trying to just give an example of uh, our uh, systems here. But basically, the difference is, as a refrigerator and a liquefier, that in a refrigerator, we absorb the energy more or less at one temperature, like 4K or like 2K. In a liquefier, we take the room temperature gas at 300K, and we store it in a liquid at, say, in a, in a helium at 4K. So we are cooling from 300K down all the way to 4K. But as we cool, the amount of energy we absorb from 300K to 290K is a lot less valuable than when we cool from 10K to 4K. Because as you go down and down, the how to extract energy becomes harder and harder. So the amount, the value of the energy required to cool the same temperature span, say 10 K, 20 Kelvin to 10 Kelvin, is a lot more than cooling from 300 to 290 Kelvin. The temperature ratio, temperature delta may be the same, but the amount of energy required because they all have to reject back to 300 Kelvin, which is 300 to 290 is a lot closer to 300, so we can dump it much quicker. I mean, take it very close to the surface and dump it. But if you go deeper and deeper to 20 Kelvin to 10 Kelvin, it's a lot harder to, so it takes a lot more, even the reverse pool work a lot more warm. So that's where the difference is. So, and even on an ideal basis, as you go lower and lower, at 4 Kelvin, we said it takes 70 watts per watt if everything is reversible. So this is basically, in the introduction, uh, we had this thing to, uh, where, say, this is our air conditioner where it only requires 14 or 0.14 watts per one watt of cooling. And as you come to, say, liquid nitrogen, it takes 3 watts per one watt of refrigeration at 77 Kelvin. And it takes 70 watts at 4 Kelvin. And as you go to 2 Kelvin, it takes 150 watt per watt. So you can see how steep this curve is with temperature. And these are the various fluids. Uh, it will tell you, as you want to go lower and lower temperature, which fluids you can, any fluid above that boiling, uh, 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 I mean anything fluid below that the boiling temperature at which you want to work can be chosen. But the fluid which, the, it is better to choose the fluid which is very close to where you want to absorb the heat because it will give you the two-phase characteristics which will be more easy to adapt into the cycles. So you try to use, say, in 
for example, liquefied nitrogen, you use nitrogen as a fluid rather than helium because you can condense much more easily at the AAT Kelvin level and you can work with it and you can design uh, the components more economically using that fluid rather than using helium for uh, liquid, uh, liquefied nitrogen. So, but you can use helium for liquefied nitrogen or you can use helium for liquefied hydrogen but in hydrogen liquefied again you use hydrogen rather than helium because as you use a fluid which is different, you cannot use nitrogen for hydrogen liquefaction because nitrogen will freeze by 65 Kelvin whereas you need 20 Kelvin to get to hydrogen. So, you can always choose a fluid with a lower boiling point temperature to use but it's better to use the fluid which is you, the temperature you are, you are desiring for your refrigeration for it to be the, makes the cycle uh, easier to design, components easier to design and more close to the idea rather than as you, as the fluid gets farther and farther away, the irreversibility starts stacking up on you. So, that's the thermo helium refrigerator, basically like uh, in our delta is, that, that's specific thermo work and this is the COP inverse, this is the amount of thermo work, that's the amount of energy we are basically absorbing. So, this will tell you the COP inverse, uh, this is the this is, this is the amount of watts you need to put into your compressor for this many watts you are absorbing. We use this a lot because basically we are interested in how many watts are we have to pay for each watt. For example, let's take 2 Kelvin at our central helium liquefier. We put in almost like 1.3 to 1.4 kilowatts of one watt of 2K. Okay? And at CDF, we use 3.5 kilowatts for one watt of 2K. And when people talk much simpler terms, oh, I need only 10, oh, 10 watts here, 10 watts there. But look at its amount of impact on the amount of power they draw. And we go into more detail of how, how I mean, serious they are. In the past, when energy was cheap, yeah, I guess it didn't get the impact it desired. Eventually, it's catching up. That's one thing I enjoy, bringing up why, I mean, to minimize the environmental effect and also the effect on our resources because they are very valuable resources. I mean it takes 20 million years to produce that uh, oil, what, 100 years or 120 years, like there is no tomorrow we are spending it. So I mean we have a I mean, uh, responsibility here in making what we do in a more efficient way and this I am hoping will show some of the things what we can do to make these things that much more efficient and and so we'll get into those things. That's, these are the fundamentals which will tell you as you get deeper into deeper how to analyze these things. And so, in a, in a, in a, the, the, if you go through the steps, so the, these are the various three factors we explained, Kena, Delta S, Delta H, and the Carnot work, compressor work minus expander. So if you plug in all the properties of the helium, this is how much is the uh, 15, uh, 14, 50 watts per gram per second is what will go into the compressor to compress isotrop, isothermally. And this is the amount of heat you can absorb from liquid helium to liquid vapor at one atmosphere. And, and <coughs> this is the compressor work and this is the amount of expander work it will produce in a refrigerator. The rest, the difference is the amount, if you like the CTF, if, we, if this goes back into the, our grid, the difference is what we have to get from the grid to go into the compressor. So 14, 30 watts is what we have to draw on an ideal cycle and this is the amount will come out of the expander. This is what goes into the compressor. And if you put, plug in all these numbers, so it tells you where the 70 watt per watt on an ideal cycle is, how we came up with that number. <coughs> Basically, this is the thermodynamic analysis of that. So if the expander work, like CH all and where some of these expanders like when you when your machines are very big uh, and uh, the, when we use turbo expanders they run anywhere from oh, 50,000 to 300,000 RPM and it's not economical to absorb the few kilowatts it gives out to bring it down the gear ratios and the losses and the controls and 
so we throw it away. So in a refrigerator, if you throw it away, because this amount of work coming out is so small, 20 watts, and if it only goes from 70 watts to 71 watts, it's not as significant to ignore the expander work in a refrigerator. So if you go to a liquefier, where helium liquefier, where you take one atmosphere, 300 Kelvin gas, you compress it, you go through an expander, and it leaves the system here, and a lot of the flash it comes back. So the T0 delta S is 8.4 kilowatts per kilo per second. The delta H, you are cooling from here to here. It's not 20 anymore, it is 1.5 kilowatts per gram per second. And the delta work, and this much work it would have come out at 1. kilowatts. So that is, and the net, net, net work is 6.8 kilowatts per gram per second. So there is 18% of the work in a liquefier is the expander work. It's not small in a, in a liquefier. So there's a big difference between the both for a lot of people. What's the difference between a liquefier and a refrigerator? That is the difference, where the expander's work is a substantial amount of the total power we put in and throwing away. Of course, we'll come into picture where we throw it away with a lot of these systems. I mean, but because of the practical reasons. But it's good to understand what we're throwing away and what its implications are. So, okay, this is another thing. We have a machine a helium machine design as a liquefier and refrigerator. And it shouldn't matter because it's the same compressor, same expander working between those two temperatures. In one case, we are putting heat in and we are circulating in a closed cycle. In another case, we are taking some liquid out at cold end and we are putting uh, gas at the warm end. So people ask them, what is it worth for me if I take a liquefier and want to make it a refrigerator on an ideal basis. Basically, what did we say? It requires, if all the expanded work is recovered, we need 6.8 kilowatts. Uh, yeah, 6.8 kilowatts if we recover the expanded work from here. And we said we need 70 watts if we require, the, I mean, uh, recover the expanded work. Our 100 watts is same as one gram per second of liquefaction. Give or take a minute. So, if we recover everything and follow the reversible process, 100 watts at 4K is same as one gram per second liquefaction. So, let's go to the other end where we throw away the expander work. Now, out of the 8.3 kilowatts, 1.5 kilowatts is thrown out, so we still have to put 8.3. It is 7 to so it becomes 120 watts for one watt of refrigeration. So people loosely throw these things, you know, oh, one watt is, I mean, one gram per second is 100 watts. You got to pay attention. That's a 20% effect on you, whether you account expand work or not. In our case here, where we will we'll go to the, yeah, as we come, I'll explain a bit more. <laughs> When we say 120 volts, so ideal power required uh, <coughs> as a refrigerator to the liquefier from, if we do both those ratios, we are at 82. See, when you throw away the expander work, we already lost 18% of the efficiency of the system. We are, you can only start with 82% of the carbon by throwing away the expander work. And that's where a lot of these helium liquefiers, we design a lot of refrigerators with 30% car now, but when you run it as a liquefier, it only gives you 25% because, and a lot of, I didn't understand it when I was, when I started in this business in the 80s, I, I couldn't figure it out where I'm losing this 5% and, and to go through all the details and account it. Like I said, you can account everything. That's the advantage of this analysis. So. This is where the plus is because the expander work is lost. So if you put it on a PS scale, uh, this is the temperature and this is the kilowatts per minute per second. So this is the expander work you can extract as you come down. So most of the expander work is by 80 Kelvin or by liquid nitrogen for a helium system. This all comes out. 
So this is the amount of idle work you need in this uh, helium refrigeration as you go down uh, for kilowatts per gram per second, so the 8.3 kilowatts we said. And if you throw away the expand of work, and so these are the various terms. You can see those three terms we used in our analysis, how the temperature will play in a role, and this is the 4.2 Kelvin level. And you can see uh, the effect of it. This is the 8, 8 kilowatts, the total, if you throw away the expand of work. If you use the expand of work, this is 6.2 kilowatts. This is the expand of work. Of, so you can look at those numbers and where uh, how the temperature is uh, affecting how much expand work we can expect uh, we can extract out of it and where it's not worth it and as you study more closely you will start seeing it on an person basis basically it will tell you same graph with temperature versus the person basis where it is economical where it is not economical so to put it in more number form rather than graph form, I thought it's probably the same. So let's take the a liquefier where we are cooling from 300 to 80 Kelvin after liquid nitrogen. We use liquid nitrogen to free cooling. And where the amount of Tina Delrius is 2.2 2 kilowatts per gram per second. It's 24% uh, uh, of the energy, I mean Tina Delrius is 24%. And 80 to 4 Kelvin is the Tina delta S is 6.3 kilowatts or 75 percent. Going from 300 to 4 Kelvin, see it takes 300 to 80 Kelvin, it only takes 25 percent of the energy. And to go from 80 Kelvin down to 4 Kelvin takes 75 percent of the energy. So, so the delta H or the amount of energy went in is the, or the, the thermal energy is 73 percent go from 300 Kelvin to 80 Kelvin. There is to pull 220 Kelvin, we have to put, we are pulling 73 percent of the thermal energy, but we are only using uh, the 11, 13 percent of the, uh, the reversible work and to Cool 27% uh, of the thermal energy to go from 80 Kelvin to 4 Kelvin, it is taking 87% of the reversible work. What, what I'm trying to bring out here is we use liquid nitrogen from 300 to 80 Kelvin. The value of the uh, refrigeration from 300 to 80 Kelvin is a lot less than 80 Kelvin down to 4 Kelvin. That is why we use liquid nitrogen because its exergic values. Lot, is a lot less than the going from 80 to 4. And so you can look at the various numbers in percents, how each one is playing, and that will basically explain when you study it where the exergy effect is, where the thermal effect is. These are the thermal effects. These are the thermal energies, and these are the reversible work it takes. So reversible work it takes is so small, but this 73% of the thermal energy. So that's, the, that's basically uh, the clarity. So if you look at various fluids, basically these are the amount of energy it takes, how many watts per gram per second, and how many watts per watt for various fluids. So in summary, basically kind of work requires the I mean, differentiation between a refrigerator and a liquefier. The effect of they will recover the expanded work and if you throw it away, what happens? And the practical systems are compared to the pro I mean, when we are compared to the reversible work. So, that's true. Any questions? I know, I mean, there's a lot here, as you folks can go back and uh, look at the, the, that's why I thought the notes in the back should give you when you study it, how we explain it, and you can spend your time and if you further if you have questions on it. Like you said, most of all, I mean, you don't have to come to me. I mean, there are quite a few people in our prayer group that are very familiar, very thorough with all these principles. They live and breathe all these things. So you can go to anybody who is access to you, who you are comfortable with, and they will all, most of them will be very So feel free and use that.
I guess the next one is the the ideal PDM systems. So in this, what we're trying to compare is uh, we use the ideal gas because if we start mixing too many real systems, we we start losing where we are introducing the loss mechanisms, where we are introducing the other factors. So I try to go one step at a time uh, to bring it to the real uh, effects at the final level. So now let's say we use ideal gas. So that way we can keep uh, some of the irreversibilities uh, not come, mixed into the other factors. So this gives us an analysis basically. So why we, we are into this is way back when I started early 80s uh, uh, into this business uh, in the industry, I didn't understand. We used to have this 1400 so from Sam Collins. Our company was started from MIT spin off at CDI with me, Dan, and we all worked and learned the fundamental steps of these cryogenic helium refrigerators. Where we were designing a lot of plants with two expanders, and we are choosing all this. And when we go to the bigger uh, systems, we had more steps. There was no place I could find where I can understand where we place these expect where we place these various components and what what governs these uh, the placement of various components in the cycle. Because at that time, the computers are becoming more and more uh, easy, I mean, available. So most of the time, we are just putting various simulation models into it. And by the time the request comes from the uh, user, you got a very small window. So you try to run your cycles and simulations as much as you can and you come up with a proposal. And we were never happy because we really did not understand all the fundamentals controlling the independent and dependent parameters to tell us how we're doing the right selections. So in the spare time, in the early 80s, I was trying to do and spend my time to understand. Given everything is ideal, everything is set, we got ideal fluids and ideal things. How do we place these things was my keen interest. So that's where I coined this term Carlo step. Because Carlo process is the most reversible. I said, okay, let's come up with a term. How do we place our steps? And let's say if we can come up with and a Carlo step. Is, uh, is basically tip, uh, is a is a process step. For example, we use multi-stage compressors like first, second stage, three stage, or single stage. And how do we select where we stop the first stage and where we pick up the second stage and where we pick up the first? What determines it? Similarly, we want to use so many expanders from room temperature down to four down. Where do we place them? So what makes these things, what, what are our goals? So that's basically optimization goals, which I get into next in the next class. But to lead into that, what made the fundamental stepping stones or st uh, the blocks to lead into that is what I'm going to go now. Is one of them is the Carno step. Uh, it tells you we got basic steps in a compressor, how many steps and where do we place. Similarly, we have so many steps in an expansion to get from this temperature, and how do we place? Similarly, in a load. So that's basically our power in any process. We want to make the irreversible to the minimum, and that's what I coined the name Carnot step. What provides the minimum irreversibility in the process is the Carnot step. Basically, if you, in a, in an easier way to explain, is a, if you have a multi-state uh, and this basically, like I said, is the minimum amount of input energy is what the Carnot step is. And in a helium system, we got the load, we got the cold box, we got the compressor. So each one has its own Carnot steps. So the load, for example, yeah, we always say, okay, we got so much sensible load, we got so much heat leak. They're all part of the load. We got. Again, the other thing we try to 
really properly evaluate is including, say, for example, we supply three atmosphere into our uh, distribution into the uh, into the LINAC or into the loads. Where there's a JT valve takes three atmosphere and takes it down to one atmosphere or the two uh, I mean, or three atmospheres to the two K. There's a losses involved, but that part of the load. That load came from because we needed that three atmosphere the distribution. So somebody has to pay for all these things. So we need to account when we are asking certain requirements. Where you draw the boundary is very important. When you say we need certain pressure is required, so that's part of the load. And when we put so much into your two K load, that's yeah that we all understand that primary load. But then we got the distribution where our transfer lines, our bayonets, our valves. There's a heat leak into that. That's part of the load. So, how do we space all these things? Where do you space? I mean, what is the fraction? And how do you so that the total carbon work of all this is less coming into the refrigerator? So, you need to play. When you design your loads, you need to start playing a lot of uh, uh, analysis and uh, in analysis and design to make sure you're not introducing a lot of losses, not thinking about it, because it happened to us. For example, in the Linux, where we thought we'll have very small load on our return, we have. Uh, and our return header has like 500 watts of heat leak bottle by the time it comes to the Linux. We thought it will be only 50 Kelvin, I and mean 50 watts in our fundamental original thought, because we really, yes, we have 4 kilowatts of load going into the prior modules. We accounted that, but we are only thinking we can handle from prior module to our 2 Kelvin with 50. But in real life, it became a factor of 10 more. And that had its effects. And if we accounted it properly, we would have been not better off. But we paid a bigger price in commissioning by not realizing upfront. So it is important to go through all the analysis as carefully as you can on the paper upfront rather than after the machine is built. So one way I thought it will give you a, a better idea of a helium refrigerator. Like I said, helium refrigerator is nothing but you have a bucket full of watts here at 4 Kelvin. You want to walk up your steps and dump it on the ground. Basically, you want to carry this heat energy or whatever. So what we use is we use the expanders to provide that cooling as you go up. So how do you space these things? And that's basically what this whole carbon analysis is. How do you carry this heat do you place them equal raises? Are you what governs the step spacing? Is the Carmo step? That's what, believe me, it cost a lot of nights, sleepless nights for me. But, and once you figure it out, it's done, simple. But it wasn't that clear until I figured it out. So then, I'm, from then on, I mean, for all the people I associate with, this is the first thing I, I make sure they understand it, they use it, because. Because that's a very strong principle, how do we space these steps? Because there are certain things, the system size determines how many you can have, and how do you space, and makes a big role in optimization. So, okay, that's, that's basically the Carlos, the expanders which provide the cooling, how do you space them with the Carlos step? So that's the number of cars of the expanders are the number of car steps for the whole box. And we get into that how do we space them. And when it compresses, so what, like you know, uses all the input energy, as I explained, you put in six megawatts of CHL and we dump it at the in the cooling tower. And we use multi-stage compression or two stage. And but we know from thermodynamics on a polytropic process basis, equal pressure ratio has the minimum for an equal flow has the minimum input work. So that's that's known from the uh, polytropic principles you can, I mean, uh, thermodynamically. So equal pressure ratio is what we want. But not recognizing, also we pay a big role, I mean, big impact on our total input power. For example, when our CHL was designed, the first stage pressure ratio was less than three, and second rate was second ratio. Second stage pressure ratio was close to eight, and and because they were looking at the cold box optimization, they were not looking at the overall system optimization. 
So what used to happen, we even when I was in the industries, we used to have various different tools. When we get the proposal, we have, I used to work in a whole box and thermodynamics, and my interest was to optimize this to the heck of it. But we used to have the compressor group, which are more industrial, who are using all the gas processing industry and petrochemical industry. That group, that's their area. We are not supposed to touch it. So they used to say, OK, we'll tell you what the pressure ratio, and you go and do your cycle around it. So there, we had a disconnect between our groups. And that's where, after we did this analysis, that's when it kind of brought the management to accept the optimization has to include more of not pieces and bits and various groups. That's when we integrated the CTI, all the optimization under one umbrella, saying that fundamentally all this has to be done overall first, then it has to be broken down and handed over to various groups to take it from there to do the final designs, not individually working from the beginning. So, Basically, and so the thermodynamics tells you basically what's XRG and the availability, that kind of interchangeable. The fluid availability is, is uh, how much, when I said one atmosphere, 300 K coming out of the cold box, going to the compressor is at the same thermal energy as 18 atmospheres going at 300 Kelvin back into that. But it has two different availabilities on the fluid coming out and going back in. But they are almost very close to the same thermal energy. And so that, those factors, how do they play a role in designing? And they're all explained. And <coughs> so for a simple two stream ideal gas, we take one atmosphere and we compress to for the high pressure. And uh, so what is the work required is the inlet uh, P delta S minus delta H. And you use the ideal Ideal gas principles, you can convert that into the uh, logarithm of the pressure. And so, basically what it tells you is, amount of entropy to be, we are playing with, so we, we take a 4 Kelvin liquid at this low entropy, and we put in heat in, and as it evaporates, the entropy increases. And all our desire is to bring this fluid back to this entropy of the difference entropy where it is 100% liquid. So, our industry is to see, we, we are covering this pan, what is the minimum pressure we have to deal with so that we can complete the cycle with the least walking distance around? Least ground we cover. So, so the available, that's available to the cold box. Basically, we can increase the availability to the cold box by multiple factors. We can increase the amount of mass flow at certain amount of S, or we can we can increase the delta S. So there are so which one is more optimal? And how do you do how do you select where you stop uh, the entropy uh, improvement, where you, you know, do mass, how much more mass for a given unit energy, and how are these will trade off. So to get into that to give you an idea on an, an ideal helium refrigerator using ideal gas. So that's why I don't want to introduce anything about real fluids yet. So let's start with just ideal and see about these factors. Basically, you know, we said, the, I mean, we will be through this um, 70 watts per watt. So this requires 70 watts of isothermal work per one watt of uh, the refrigeration of 4K. And uh, if we convert this and go back to the, this equation, delta S to ln PR, and so, and if I go back and convert it, what it tells me is, I mean, to do this process, I need a pressure ratio of 10.6. I can construct a cycle taking from liquid entropy, which is coming back as the vapor entropy, and go back in an, on an ideal fluid basis with a pressure ratio of 10.6. So that will complete my set. That's the minimum I need to keep my mass flow minimum. So that, that's what basically the 10 atmospheres is what is ideal for uh, 
the refrigerator. So there is only one carbon step because the amount of energy we need to extract is only at one temperature. We don't need to extract from room temperature down on an ideal because there are no other losses, the fluid losses or the component losses are not involved. So this has only one carbon step. Now when we go to a liquefier, so ideal liquefier, this is the amount of work we need to put in into the compressor. This is the expanded use of this the difference in compressor work minus the expander, that's the net power we have to draw from the grid. So 18 and so 6.8 kilowatts of ideal work is required. So if I go back and plug it in, plug it in, so what it tells me is I need seven 100,000 pressure ratio, not 10 anymore in a liquefier to do the same delta S as um, to do a liquefier. So there's a big difference between a refrigerator and a liquefier on the fundamental thermodynamic principles. And some of these things, that this is what it took me a lot of time to figure out a lot of these things. Uh, when I was just starting in this field, so that's why try to document all this and bring it around so people can appreciate and understand the sheer size of these numbers and their influences on the designs. So idealized helium liquefier, the recharge pressure has to be 700,000 compared to 10 in a refrigerator. So what is that? Then we know 700,000 is non-practical because we don't have it to that. Even if we produce one, that it's not going to last and provide that reliability we need. So what we do is we make it break it down into different things. We call different key pumps up. These are called the different stages. This is called the, each one is a different step basically. So in a, these are called uh, ideal cloud liquefiers steps. And this is ideal temperature step or carbon step by step. This basically establishes the, so, what, what we are saying is we can take, go from room temperature down, and we can do each one in a different step, absorbing heat in a small area. So the overall pressure ratio doesn't need to be, we are trading 700,000 into number of steps here with a smaller ratio, because we are handling one at a time. This is handling the highest, this, like that. We basically trade it. This huge pressure ratio into smaller ratio, but with the various steps. So then you can calculate from all this. So if you take temperature, how many ideal steps you can? This is all based on ideal principles of ideal gas. So how many ideal steps you need in an expansion stage can be calculated. These are all very simple plug in numbers you can figure it out. So, carbon step for each expander state. What it told me uh, at the end is for an ideal system, that step need to have an equal temperature ratio. Like we said, for a, in a compressor, we said uh, in an uh, in a isentropic process, it need to be a constant pressure ratio. In a cold box, this need to be an equal temperature ratio. This is what. It's very simple once we understand it. Believe me, I had no clue when I started doing this analysis in the early 80s to figure this out. So, the ideal flow liquefier, the expander flow temperature ratio are same for each stage or each step. Basically, in a liquefier, each expander takes the same amount of mass flow and the pressure ratio, they are all the same and that's what gives you an equal corners and the number of ideal steps can be calculated using that. So in summary, believe me, this, this, this vocabulary is just how I framed it, how I named it, doesn't mean you see in any other book, but to me, to explain to other folks, I had to give a name, I thought this is the most appropriate name because it's how close we are trying to measure with respect to carbon. So that's why I named the term carbon. Some people have objection because carbon is a pure reversible. Yeah, I salute to that. But 
If you want to compare, you always want to compare to the most ideal. Okay. One more. So how do we use all this? So in real gas, because of the fluid properties, 
you will not come back to the same point here because of the, the fluid properties involved. So if you do that and have that and if you account that and come back and plug it to the same numbers, instead of 70 watts, you already have 130 watt per watt. Just the real gas already doubled, almost doubled the implication of the irreversibilities associated with that. Uh, the specific heat changes, which we, in ideal gas, that's constant. That's one number. In real gas, it's not. It varies, and it becomes stronger and stronger, and reaches a peak as it comes close to the critical pressure. Uh, and so, so these are the irreversibilities we need to, they're not going to give away, they're not going to go, go away in the real system, so we have to deal with those. So, in a constant entropy difference process, then we said, okay, Let's devise a cycle where this is what we want because we're starting here and after we put in the heat, we end up here and we want to come back. So let's come up with a cycle which maintains this delta S constant. So we went through to figure out is there a cycle, something we can design. So we went and said, look at how much what comes out and I guess we need to a bit. So when we come back, I guess, so this is the amount of work uh, comes, uh, as you see, as you come down, is the extracted work as you come down in temperature. And this is the, high, the high pressure stream. See, this is how we have to drop the pressure as you, 300K to follow, what I'm trying to say is to follow the delta S is not an easy step. So you, you need some cold compressors and some expanders and all these require and if you follow the process to be on a constant delta S, this is how it places. I mean these are all theoretical basis to understand where we are, where limitations are. And like we said, uh, the temperature step plays a big role in how many steps we need the expander efficiency plays a big role. So if you have the higher the expander efficiency for a given pressure ratio, say if you say a pressure ratio of 10, if your expander efficiency is under such you get a temperature ratio of 2.5, if your expander ratio is efficiency is 70, you get only 1.75. So that means from 300K going down to 4K, those temperatures to cover, in, as the expander rate, the efficiency comes down, you need more of them. So if you have more and more efficient expanders, it takes less to cover the same temperature span. So, and we also recognize, based on some practical limitations, we cannot use as many expanders as we like in the calculator from the ideal cycle because as you come down, the expander the output is coming down lower and lower and they are not becoming uh, practical at some point depending on the size of the load. So then we introduce components, heat exchanges in between the uh, expanders. So then you want to figure out what is the best way to space a heat exchange and expander combination. How does this block, what is the ideal block for this so that the overall efficiency of the system is the most efficient. And so these are all the various ways of optimization between practically available components and and to the real fluids, real effects, and all those things taken into account, and broken down to march through to introduce various effects. So, in a refrigerator to liquefy, this is another thing. Uh, we, so, in a refrigerator, we said we all we need is a one expander at the cold end because all the gas coming at 4K comes back, pulls back in the heat exchange most of it, and you need very few expanders access to handle heat exchange losses, heat leaks and the real fluid properties. In a liquefier, you're extracting energy 300K down to 4 Kelvin at different levels. So you need more expanders in a liquefier. You need more heat exchangers in a refrigerator. And if you take a machine designed as a liquefier, uh, a machine designed as a refrigerator, and try to use it as a liquefier, you will not get, see, I mean, we calculated 100 watts same as one gram per second on a Carnot basis. That's ideal. In real life, 
if you design a, a refrigerator and try to use as a liquefier, uh, for example, our end station refrigerator is designed as a refrigerator, not as a liquefier. When we, that's why it takes 150 watts of its capacity to produce one gram a second. Because it's, it has very few expense, it only has two and a nitrogen. So, and it's not as uh, efficient. So, or if you take the other one, like for example, uh, NSNS, we have the, uh, the, our CHL, which is a liquefier. What happened is, we did not specify as a refrigerator the coolant. The coolant heat exchangers are small. So, all it produces for one gram, it, it's a good liquefier, but as a refrigerator, it's what only half. So, when you do the systems, you want to make sure, because we are putting the compressor capable of doing this no matter what. And you want to make sure, you want to design a system as a balanced, as close to balanced as possible. That's what we did for the trial gel system there. It can go from one end to the other end, and partially or whatever, so it can move without going this extreme to this extreme. Better. It is more or less followed with the real systems. So, in summary, I'd like to give you what a thermostat is, I know, I have a very fast. And, and also try to give you what the real fluid effects are. So, basically, these are all the ideal ways of analysis. We are starting with ideal gas, ideal placement of components, and now we'll go into the real systems in how do we optimize real cycle. How do we design real cycles? And how do we take an existing system and how do we optimize it? Then we'll go into the floating pressure dynamic cycle. How we converted all these to make an equation. So if, any questions on this? Two slides back. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. I'm sorry. No. The one with a picture of the two systems side by side. What's that? The two sets of expanders side by side. Uh, uh, this one, so for example, no, no, ESR. No, I'm sorry, one more, um, one more slide. Go backwards, one more. There you go. Okay. Is the one on the left how you build it, and the one on the right how you draw it? Or yeah, no, these are basically overlap. So at the end, these are all mathematically, it's the same as, these are stripped and distributed. This is the same, these two are equal. They're Basic. equal, but which one do you build? This one. Okay. This is for an analysis to show, basically okay. strip it and open, to show in a clap open, and but when you make a, a dress, this is the dress, this is the pure clap, open into cuts. Okay. To show how you place your steps, how do you design. Because hmm. you operate with one compressor, all these things, and basically showing in idealization how, you, how your steps are. Okay. I think I've got the time. So I know I went a lot faster, but there's a lot of material. So. Any other questions for our speaker? If not, I'll just give another round of applause.